Hi. Uh, thanks for coming out bright and early to the first session of DrupalCon uh, 2022. My name is Greg Dunlap, uh, and this session is called uh, um, Structured Content and Flexible Layouts, a case study of the editorial tools for Georgia.gov. Um, we have three people speaking here today. Uh, I'll, we'll do some introductions. I'm Greg Dunlap. I'm the Director of Strategy at Lullabot. Um, and, uh, yes. Hi, I'm Marissa Epstein. I am a, a senior user experience strategist and a CPAC for accessibility, also at Lullabot. Hi, I'm Rachel Hart. I am the UX UI designer with Digital Services Georgia. So uh, we did this project um, a while back. Uh, so about 10 years ago, Digital Services Georgia, who is the agency that controls all of the web presence for the state of Georgia and its state government agencies, they kind of recognized that maintaining a more consistent user experience for their constituents would be really helpful for getting people to find things and use their websites. And so to this end, they had created a Drupal 7 platform for managing the websites of all of their government agencies. And it provided the agencies with a common tool set for managing their content, which would in turn help increase consistency for constituents who are trying to find content and you know, create a better user experience for them. Now, Georgia has about 120 agencies and despite there being no mandate to join the platform, about two thirds, of, two thirds of them did end up migrating in. But what didn't change was the governance model for this content. So the authors at the agencies are subject matter experts and they know their, their um, content and their constituent needs better than anybody else. And so it didn't make a lot of sense to have a ton of process getting in their way. They're, they're sitting there creating the content that they know every day. But the wide variety in web and content skills across those agencies and the people who created the content within them made it really difficult to um, establish or hold any, any um, content guidelines or standards or guardrails or anything like that. And the ones that they did were kind of controversial and it was tough because those agencies, since they weren't mandated to be on the platform, they could just jump ship and launch a WordPress site anytime that they wanted. Um, but that's not very good for their constituent experience because the platform helps to bring consistency, as I said, but also better accessibility, better mobile uh, experience and things like that. So digital services knew that even if the constituent experience wasn't perfect in the system, if the agencies left, it would get even worse. Um, this quote really sums it up from one of the stakeholders at Georgia when she was, ex when she was ex um, explaining this problem. Uh, we don't have any carrots, all we have, I mean, we don't have any sticks, all we have is carrots. Oh, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. All we have is carrots, we don't have any sticks. They can't, uh, they can't establish any rules or negative effects to get um, the um, agencies to stay. All they can do is entice them in. So there were a lot of problems to solve here, but one of the biggest ones surrounded how to manage the content authoring in the new system. So the agency authors have a wide variety of content to meet, the, uh, to meet their needs, and those needs are really, really varied across the different agencies. Now, some strides had been made in that system on landing pages, which allowed them to cr assemble flexible groups of blocks and things like that. However, they were tightly controlled and authors weren't empowered to change them directly. The updates had to be passed through the ticketing system back to digital services. At the same time, the main content pages had few options available other than basic formatting and imagery. So all of these content authors weren't particularly happy with the situation that they had. Um, at the same time, digital services wanted to establish more consistency and predictability. There were too many ways to do the same thing across all of the agencies, even with a centralized system, and it was causing a lot of dissonance for constituents that they, as they jumped from agency to agency finding different kinds of content. A new common design system was gonna help this, but there also needed to be more common content patterns and common uh, ways to create pages to serve more common use cases. And then finally, the constituents, want, they just want clear, findable content. They wanna be able to get to the sites 
figure out what, uh, what they need and get to it quickly and easily. And so um, we created a process for doing this and I'm gonna pass this off to Marissa to talk about that. All right, thank you, Greg, and apologies. I've uh, been having a little too much fun, so I'm losing my voice. Uh, so, yeah, jumping into the process of what we did to actually tackle this problem and uh, also how we uncovered some of the problems Greg's described, this is a process that follows roughly four months of research and content strategy, and I've gone ahead and broken that down into three phases. First is research. Um, this is to understand the problem from all of the perspectives involved. We had different kinds of people experiencing the pains that Greg discussed in very different ways. And so um, we did conduct research with Georgia residents. However, I wanted to focus on the flexibility for authors here. So I'm going to talk through our process just with the authors of state agencies. So our first interactions were uh, what we call contextual interviews. And uh, the reason for this is to just drink from the fire hose and absorb so much information about the current editorial experience, how it's going, what could be better. Um, we learned about authors' goals and what complicate those goals. And we also got a sense of their comfort levels with um, the CMS and technology in general. So why are they contextual interviews? Um, because we physically went to each person's office and often desk, um, which was uh, lovingly coordinated by Georgia. Uh, so we ran around uh, hot Atlanta for two days and uh, got to see where the work actually gets done, which was um, very useful to bring back to our team. So I really like uh, some, some takeaways from this first step. Um, and they capture some of the lessons learned. Um, please enjoy. <laughs> um, some people know that the site is inconsistent. Some people know that it doesn't look great. Uh, some people know they're doing things that are not encouraged. Um, and, and so to this, I wanted to say why. Um, it seems like there were um, some, some things to dig into deeper. The next step of research was um, a heuristic design audit, which sounds a lot fancier than it is. This is kind of an informal, usually solo process of reviewing the website, understanding how the content was structured, and um, also how uh, design patterns were currently being used. There's what the system is and then how it's actually um, being, being um, taken upon by authors to um, get around some of the editorial restrictions. Um, and this helped us see what patterns might be missing that we would build in the future. So, um, I often suggest to take a breath before this one. So um, just some delightful examples that we captured from the uh, georgia.gov umbrella. Um, so you know, real sites that were um, intended to share a design system. But as you can see, the authors were creating workarounds um, for those site restrictions. So this presents some issues in accessibility and compatibility with screen readers and all of that, um, but also essentially um, ends up in the situation that the restrictions were put in place to avoid. Um, these workarounds end up with inconsistency in the design and can lead to some trust issues on the part of the constituents. So uh, we got a lot of inspiration here on things that we could um, provide as far as buttons and layout options and other things that authors were making themselves. So to recap the research, um, we knew that we needed to make content creation more intuitive because um, if something wasn't comfortable for a user uh, or familiar, it would just be ignored um, in favor of the tool they knew. Um, and we needed to provide templates with much more customization to meet a, a huge pool of uh, agency needs. And uh, we knew that authors would find a way if we didn't. So, um, you know, the proverbial using any tool as a hammer when they saw a nail was what we wanted to uh, prevent. And to this end, we believed that providing best practices and celebrating real examples could be one of the carrots in our tool belt. Okay, so now we're equipped for our second phase, sharing informed recommendations with the team and refining them together. So, um, we did present this in an in-person workshop and it was a little longer. So I'm gonna try to give a shorter pitch. I'm missing some images in my slide deck. All right, um, I'm not sure if we can
you want to take a moment and Probably see just, if we can... If we just... Um, oh, shoot. <laughs> and we haven't even come to the live demo. <laughs> so I can actually see what I'm doing. Ah. My next couple are blank. I think I might have screwed that up this morning. Were the slides edited or just, just from loading I was it? trying to make it um, available offline and I just kind of oh. messed it all up. Well, I like where you were going with it. I know, right? Hmm. I should be. Yeah. It might be a bit spotty. I can try using my hotspot. Oh my gosh, no, nothing wants to load. Um, maybe there's some level of local tech problem and some level of not being able to get on the, uh, not getting the Wi-Fi to load. Okay. Looks like we're connected, but nothing is coming up. Okay. Um, OCC. Yeah. Try that one. Yeah. Okay. It looks like it was starting to move. Mm -hmm. I think that was because you switched Wi Fi. Yeah. Okay. I think you still need okay, to select just... one, but if it works, great. You see what I mean? Scroll down. Let me switch back to the other one. I'm on to my hotspot. That's what we were on. Okay. Is this offline? This is the wrong talk. Yeah, let's do a cover. This is the wrong talk. <laughs> okay, it's going let's great. Get down. I'm just gonna tell everyone to picture it. <laughs> are all the photos gone? It looks like these are trying to load. Okay. It's going to be worth it. <laughs> Do you want to try? Oh, because you're going, I see you're trying to go back. Yeah, we'll see. Do you want to try and get back on the Drupal Wi-Fi so that the images go? I just don't, I mean, I, I'll go to it. I was going to see if we can like to it from my phone, but I don't think that's the issue. Right, that's what I was. Because there's other Is it like... Should we restore an old one or something? Well, if it's actually there. Yeah. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, like this is from a week ago and it's still not showing the, the images. Because it's the offline mode? I don't know. Can I, you I go back to that and change it? Well, can you make it? Um, that's not what I want. I just switched back to the triple con. Okay. We've been float between a few. Okay. Yeah, the OCC Wi-Fi isn't open. It was giving us a lot of screen and saying bye. Uh-huh. And follow what you're saying about the OCC should be switched? Well, he, we have to have the login, so he's asking somebody for it so that we can get on to it because the. So we have our uh, we have our we're, our presentation on Google Slides, which is great when you have internet. Um, and the um, internet, nothing's nothing's on the we're on the DrupalCon Wi-Fi and nothing's loading, and so the tech is going to get us a login for the greater OCC Wi-Fi so that we can get back up but for the moment, uh, we're a little stuck. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Uh, 
all of, for some reason, on uh, the laptop that we were using, every image in the entire deck disappeared for no reason, despite the fact, even when we were loading on the internet, it was very strange. So uh, here we go, we're back in business, and <laughs> I'll hand it back to Marissa. Yeah, thanks again. Okay, um, let me give you my hypothesis pitch now, and we'll see if, if it cuts out, make lots of noise. Okay. So each content type in Drupal uh, can be displayed in a vi variety of ways, and these are called our display modes. So example, a uh, full page versus a teaser are default display modes within uh, Drupal for content. And we started talking about this and how we could leverage additional custom display modes to create pages that are essentially assemblies of different pieces of content displayed this way. This eventually made its way into two broad concepts. So on the left you can see topic pages, which are um, standard long form text pages, except content can be embedded into the text in different ways. Um, on the right um, are landing pages, which are only an aggregation of that content throughout the site. So just pulling those different blocks that you can see there. There we go. And key to both of these solutions is a third, which is uh, what we've been calling micro content. So these are small pieces of structured content, and I have a ton of examples up for you here on this flickering slide. And um, the main way that it differs from normal site content, uh, the micro content, is that it does not live at its own URL. It's only meant to be featured on another page and not linked to and visited separately. So um, for example, we have uh, link collections, calls to action, and icon lists. So one of the things um, that we like about micro content is that it's um, structured to be easily reusable. You can see here we've labeled some of the fields uh, that specifically define how it will be rendered in terms uh, in for the user. So this is a small tile set micro content type. Um, you can see the title, the series of links and icons and images, and um, the URL at the bottom in the button that can take people to information. So uh, a nice feature of that is once we have that structure, you can see we can easily go from one column to two, two, three. And another great feature of micro content is that it's reusable. So um, this uh, promo that you can see here was made once and then used in multiple places throughout the site. Uh, so if you need to update that link, you can do it one time on the micro content directly and then that updates everywhere. Um, and so this is a really big help for maintaining pages over time, uh, but I'll save the cons for Rachel. Now, we had this great idea. Uh, we thought this was solid, but we needed the author buy-in. Um, as we saw, it doesn't matter if they have a good tool if it's not comfortable because it won't be used. So uh, when I say testing in this third phase, I don't mean the comprehensive usability testing. I'm talking about testing our hypothesis with authors. So um, specifically, uh, I'm going to go through a few examples that brought the highest impact for providing more flexible layouts. So I'm really excited about this first step of testing. This was paper prototyping. Um, it's a great way to engage participation, and it's a low fidelity workshop, so it doesn't require a lot of um, coding and setup. The goals here, um, we wanted to validate the page builder in that landing page uh, sketch that you saw before and see if agency authors would be happier with the drag and drop or if this was um, not cohesive with their workflow. And we also wanted to test it against real content. So if we went to an agency website, um, are they um, able to recreate all of their content there um, and also make content that they want in the future? Essentially, would the framework um, flourish or flounder? So here's an example of that paper prototyping that I described. Um, and this was a workshop that we did with, I believe, the Environmental Protections Division. Um, so you can see in the, in the image here, um, we're kind of working together 
and they're calling out some components that they like to build into their landing page. So the components are sketched on uh, flashcards on the right, and um, you can see just some very basic components from the design system we were using. Um, in the center, we have um, just a, a laminated piece of 11 by 17 piece of paper. So we could stack the flashcards on it, and we could also do some sketching um, if we needed with uh, dry erase markers. And from there, we just kind of selected the cards and ordered them on the, law, the long sheet, and then drew in any custom details. So this process allowed us to start with the proposed components that we came in with, um, but then see things like which of the components were important to different agencies, um, which ones weren't quite working uh, for everyone because they might need an additional presentation, or um, if anything was just flat out missing and that we needed to create additional components. Um, so you can see an example of that um, with this finished homepage, and we got pretty close. We had to you know, um, write in some titles of lists and um, change our icons from four to eight, but they were pretty happy with the system. The second testing step um, that I wanted to uh, discuss here focused on actually naming the content types. So um, the landing page was just one of the many content types that we were working on, and um, there was a variety of ways that we approached this. Some of them we felt were working as is, some were added, some were consolidated that were very similar, um, and now we just wanted to make sure that the authors understood them. We thought this is you know, a pretty important barrier to entry right up front, um, and so um, we were able to essentially uh, start with a survey, just asking if you were creating this, which one of these would you use? And then we were able to dig in a lot deeper um, with interviews that we paired with that paper prototyping to look at specific content or understand why they wouldn't use a content type, for example. So um, the, the task here, firstly, was to correctly identify the best content type for um, a particular piece of content. Then we reviewed the create new content page itself and made sure that that was clear in the way it was laid out. And then, again, we asked them to map a couple of their content pages. So if there's a page that you wish you had, which of these types do you think you could use? So I think this uh, quote sums up nicely our findings, um, that we saw a positive response to the content model and the layout builder functionality. Nothing was broken, everything's a step in the right direction, a lot of options, a lot of flexibility is what we wanted to hear. Um, and then that second thing there, everything could be reproduced, was one of our successes that we wanted to measure as well. So finally, um, one more testing visual for you. Um, this is the area where you do create that new content. Um, this is what Georgia calls their type tray. And um, this is where I was talking about, we, we just printed this out and asked them to imagine that they were using the site. And it was nice to get some UI feedback and some features like pinning um, content types that authors would use most frequently uh, per user and things like that. Um, but one of the, the findings I wanted to share, for example, is that we had created a an amalgamation, an aggregate of different um, news posts, and we had called it update, as in um, it, you're sharing an update with the constituents. And um, the first couple authors that we shared that with asked us, update what? And heard that as a verb. So we quickly changed that to news for the rest of our tests and saw that that was successful. So it was really great to just iterate right off of this on paper. And finally, I'll note that the Lullabot developers have contributed this type tray back to um, the Drupal ecosystem as a module. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to hand things off to Rachel now. Uh, we are going to dive into a real demo at the end, hence all the, the tech setup. Um, but she's going to give us an overview of um, our changes and what's happened since. All right, so we all work with tech issues, right? If it's not turn it off and turn it back on, then what is the solution when you can't get things loading properly in your browser? Clear the cache. Clear the cache. <laughs> Got it working. Oh no. And how do I get, I want this over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because we need to get the presenter stuff. Oh, fun. Yeah. It should be back on there. Yeah. But where is the window? Where's the presenter now? Yeah. Oh, because I don't think you did presenter view. You just did right. That. It just needs to be. We're so. Okay, I'm happy chance. with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So sorry. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about the results and what we've seen. Um, so for example, on the left, you see what a landing page looked like on the old version of the site. And then on the right is on the new version of the site. So of course, there are some stylistic changes here. Um, we have a, a new design system that we implemented along with the update, but the new system also with, with this um, using Layout Builder gives us the flexibility to uh, really make the page whatever it needs to be. We have different uh, block types and then just all these different layout options that you really can build and put together however you need it to be. And then we also see a benefit with our more text heavy pages. So again, on the left side is, is what it used to be. And really it's just a vertical column of text. Uh, you know, you could add in some images and maybe a block quote, um, but for the most part, it's just, it's just one big WYSIWYG. Um, and then on the right side, we are making use of that reusable micro content. So rather than just all being fully unique content on the page, we can have these blocks that we can reuse elsewhere and then also embed within the WYSIWYG on, on this page specifically. So we launched our first sites in GovHub uh, in, in this system in 2019. So we've had a few years now to uh, see how editors are actually using it and see what has gone well and what not so much. So first off, we do have more editor control. So like Greg said in the previous system, uh, the ability to edit landing pages was pretty locked down. Um, they could swap out content in the blocks, but um, they didn't have access to add new blocks or to move them around or really change the layout in any way. And so we really just loosened the reins on that when we uh, updated into the new system. Um, part of that was because we felt pretty confident that they, the, the, in, the system was intuitive enough that they could edit it uh, with some training, of course, and with some, some pre-knowledge and with us still being available to help them, we wanted to loosen that up. And that's something that our editors have really responded well to. Um, and then this also is really important for making quick and timely updates. So for example, throughout the past couple of years, of course, uh, every website has COVID-19 information. Um, and with the ability for editors to fully create and edit landing pages on their own without needing to go through us, that means that they can make all of this information on their website available immediately. And, you know, of course, looking at these, there are things that I would change. It's, it's not perfect. It's not the most beautiful page layout that I've seen, but it does get the information out there. And that's, that's the most crucial part for this, is just making it available. And then we can always go back later and make any tweaks that we need to to improve the page. And this also opens up our ability to have real-time collaboration with editors. So for example, last year, we were working with the Georgia Department of Driver Services on updating their homepage. And the editor, the, the primary content manager at this agency is very aware of what her editors, or what her users need. She's always looking at the data and she's very in touch with her stakeholders. So she comes into this knowing really what needs to happen with the homepage. So she was able to, within her site, build this page in draft mode. And she shared it with us so then we could provide some feedback and 
right again within the system, send her back another draft and say, well, here are some changes, like great ideas, but this might be a better way to display it. She then gives us her final feedback and finally we land on the finished page. And so with her being able to directly edit the site, we can have this back and forth um, and, and just working directly on the same page in draft mode um, right, right within the system. So Greg and Marissa have given a really great intro into the concept of content sharing. So I wanna take a look at how that has gone so far. Now the ability to use one piece of content in multiple places um, has allowed authors to update and remove content in bulk. And overall, this has been a really big win. So for example, every site has a primary contact. So this is phone number, email address, uh, can have their, the role, whatever. Um, so this information shows up on the contact detail page. And with it being the primary contact for the site, down there in the footer, you can see you also have the option to add that information down there. You can also, uh, again, if it's the primary, it'll show on the main About Us page. You can embed it within a WYSIWYG. You can place it on a landing page. And then it will also share to georgia.gov. So all of our agencies have their own website, uh, but this information is very specific. There's not really anything that um, is super editorial with a contact, it's just phone number, email address. Um, so we share that directly to georgia.gov and that shows up on their organization page as well as on any services that are associated with that organization. And all of this information, it's, it's all over the place, all these different placements of the contact are handled with this one edit form. So if a phone number changes, they can go in there and change it in one place and that information updates everywhere that it's located. And we are continuing to update uh, content types to encourage editors to reuse their content. So this is new for a lot of people who are working on the site, so it's not always necessarily intuitive for them. So for example, editors will often add contact information directly into the WYSIWYG for a page that they're working on. Um, and like we just saw, contacts are one of those types of content that can be really beneficial if they're reused throughout the site so that if anything changes, you can you know, take care of that all in one go. And from speaking with editors, we learned that it's just an extra step for them in the moment when they're trying to put this information on a page uh, to, to you know, take a step back and think, okay, what contacts do I need? Now I need to create those contacts and then I need to give them certain taxonomy to organize into a contact directory so then I can show that contact directory on this page. It's just a little bit more abstract and uh, a little more cumbersome for them to go and create that when they just want a couple of phone numbers on this page. And so this is one place where we're taking another look at the UX of building contact directories. Um, and we really just wanna make it easier for them to just you know, grab the, the contacts that they need, stick them all into a table, put that on the page, and it's still using all of that connected content. And uh, this also introduces problems. So like I said, it's not uh, super intuitive for someone who is used to just working on individual pages. Um, they, they don't necessarily think of their website in terms of chunks. They think of it in terms of, well, I'm on this page now and I'm on a different page another time. So they might forget or not totally understand that editing micro content will update it everywhere that it exists. And so, for example, um, an editor might have a landing page and they created this for one program on their website and they really like the layout of it, so they cloned that page. So now they have these two separate landing pages on the new page, they wanna update the content there. So they swap out the information in the blocks on that new page, not realizing that it also updated that content on the old version of the, of the page, on the original program page that they had cloned. Um, so really when you, with the way that it's currently built, when you clone a landing page, it clones the layout for the page. It does not clone the, the blocks that are within it. Um, that's all still fully connected, which of course has its own benefits, but if you're not aware of that, uh, then it can create these problems. And so that brings me to my final point, which is that this is definitely a learning curve. Um, so it is a different process than editing a typical page. Uh, just it, it can be technically confusing. So 
For most content types, our editors are used to everything existing within the edit form. Uh, you just, you have these specific fields that you fill out and that creates the page and, and everything on that edit form is what is going to show up on the final page. And you're gonna see this in a little bit when Greg is doing the demo, but um, with a, something like a landing page, it's really split into two sections. So we have the title and the summary on the edit form and other than that, it's really just metadata. There's, there's not really much of what you're doing there that's gonna affect what it looks like um, in the end. And most of the actual content is controlled on the layout tab. And so you're placing the blocks and moving them around and setting up what the page is gonna look like. And so that's just, it's, it's two places for editors to go to and that's just not something that they're typically used to. And so this is, um, this gets back to the type tray that Marissa mentioned. Um, Another point that can be confusing is understanding what content is versus micro content, um, understanding what a promo is versus a CTA. Um, these, we, we have lots of things that are very similar but just different enough that we made them separate content types. And so we're continuing to look at uh, how we are making these content types available to editors and providing them with visuals and descriptions to help them make the best choices. Um, this also can be strategically confusing. Um, so like I said, mo most editors are used to working with just a vertical column of text. They just have their WYSIWYG and they fill it out and that makes the page. And now they have an entire page to fully customize and build, the, build its own layout. And that can be confusing and overwhelming uh, if you're not used to it. So um, again, you're gonna see this in the demo, but um, so you, you create the landing page and it starts off pretty empty. You go into the layout tab, you add a new section, okay, now you have to decide what is the layout for this section. So you pick that, um, and now you have some more choices to make. Do you wanna give that section a title? Do you give it a background color, a background image? Okay, so you've got your section put together, now you have to put blocks into it. Uh, so what block are you gonna choose? You have all these options. You choose your block, and now you decide some final layout options. Are you gonna put it into a card display? Are you gonna give it an icon? Um, so it's just one decision after another, and this gives them the ability to make a wide variety of, of page layouts and, and make it look exactly how they want it to. Uh, it's just, but it, it does of course add that complexity. And we are still, um, right, we are still of course building out our guidance and supporting editors uh, to put these pages together. So we have um, fully built out information on the technical piece of how do you do this. And then over time, we are still building um, some more open-ended sort of like strategic pieces of how do you put together the best sort of landing page. And so one way that we're doing that is with these hands-on workshops. Um, so we've done this a couple of times. Um, and it's, it's really just the idea of stepping away from the layout. So all of those options that I was showing you, save those until the end and start just with the content. Figure out what is it that this page is trying to accomplish, what do users need to get from it, and what content is going to uh, make those goals happen. And so then if you start there, then you have a pretty good idea by the time that you're actually getting into the system and choosing the blocks that you're using, finally, finalizing it with colors and icons and all those sorts of things. Um, so we really encourage our editors to just start from the content level and, and work from there and, and not get too far ahead of it. And um, this is also a learning curve for us. So this screenshot is from a study that we did last year where we were just trying to get kind of a baseline of our customer experience and, and how they're liking things. Um, and so this gave us a, a good idea of what is going well for editors and what we need to dig more into. Um, so now we're diving deeper into specific areas um, like web forms and document management and location lists. And we are also continuing to think about what we can do with layout builder pages um, and trying to think about how we can give them all the flexibility that they need because of course, even though we have so much flexibility, it's still not enough. They still, there's still more that they want this page, they, they have a specific idea in mind of what they want this page to look like. And we can get so far, but you know, it's, it's that balance of trying to give enough options without making it confusing and overwhelming. And so that's something that we're still continuing to work on 
um, doing more research. Of course, research always leads to more. Um, and just making these updates over time. So I'm gonna pass to Greg to get into a demo. And can I, yes. Oh, you wanted to just mirror. Oh no, okay. Uh, actually, we only have five minutes left before we're supposed to cut, and so I'm, uh, and given our technical issues, I kind of don't want to push my luck with a live demo, and so, um, but if any, and I wanted to have time for, to take questions too, so um, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'd love to get them. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that Lullabot contributed the type tray module back. What's the name of that module? Type tray. <laughs> uh, back there. Um, so the question was um, basically what are we using to do the landing pages and to do and the micro content on the standard article pages, right? Um, so for the landing pages, we used Layout Builder, um, and and that has worked out really well. For the, we do have mo actually most of the pages are more typical content types with you know a body field and different fields and stuff like that. And for those, um, we used Entity Embed to bring the micro content into the uh, WYSIWYG, so that and and it's really great because. Um, you can you can use the same micro content types in both places and you can share content really easily and it works really well If anybody is interested in seeing that demo We also did this talk at Drupal GovCon and that demo is a part of that. So if you want to go check that out, you can <laughs> I sort of wanted to hear a little bit about that and, and if there was any sort of a transition and how you went to your planning when everybody had gone home um, and, and how maybe how, how some of that, that kind of work has, has changed for you. Mm. Yeah, our initial work was done before, well before the pandemic. I think we did this project three or four years ago initially. Um, but I'll, leave, I'll ask Rachel about how things have changed in working with the agency since that started. Yeah, so um, of course everything has gone online. Um, we, we don't have the, the hands-on, you know, with the post-its and everything. Um, we are building out uh, all of our training in an LMS. Um, so we have video tutorials uh, showing just some of the basics on how to edit it. And then um, I guess like the, the example that I showed for, our, for the Department of Driver Services homepage, that's really sort of the direction that it's gone. So I don't think that we've um, actually done any large group workshops since going remote, but um, we will have uh, projects where we're working directly with one agency and we have that back and forth, um, and that's where opening up the permissions for editing these pages really comes in handy because we can have the back and forth with them and we can both be working on it at the same time. Um, and so I think that's, that's probably the primary way that we've, we've gotten into this sort of thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I'll just add a PS that um, for non-Georgia workshops, we've been primarily using Miro and so we're using that for the stickies and you can insert images to use those components sort of reusable. So it's not quite the same hands-on, but we can see you know, mice and draw and move things around in there. So it does um, mimic some of that collaboration well. More questions? Miro, M-I-R-O dot com. Thank you. Um, I wanna, I'll take one last question and then I want to make sure everybody has time to before they go to the uh, keynote. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. If we were to do this project right now, which part do we think 
we'd like to change. Um, I'll ask Rachel because she's had the most, I mean, we built and launched the project, but she's the one who works from day to day, so. Yeah. So it's, it's tough to say. I would say um, the part that I would at least wanna spend some more time with is the concept of the reusable micro contents. Um, because yeah, like I said, it's on the one hand, fantastic. On the other hand, it can be confusing. Um, and really just looking at what is the information with that micro content that is fully shared from one instance to the next and what is controlled on a page by page uh, basis. So there are times where we have a promo that we wanna show on multiple pages, but maybe here we want the image to show and over here we don't. Um, just because of the way that it comes together on the page. And so with the way that it's currently put together, we have to create two separate promos. Um, and so that sort of thing, it, it gets a little tricky and I would wanna probably spend a little more time thinking about that as well as, uh, I think we have about 17 types of micro content and some of them are very similar to each other. Um, so if we were to do it again, I think that might be another place to spend some more time thinking about, does this really need to be a totally separate type of block or is it something that can all be one, can there be the promo and the, and the CTA and uh, text block all as one type of block and then maybe there's just some display options within there so that if you wanna change this link to a button display, uh, that's a simple switch rather than having to now recreate that into a new block type. Um, thanks, everybody. I, if you have any more questions, uh, we'll be around throughout the conference. I will be at the Lullabot booth for a few hours following this and later in this afternoon. Or you can reach out on Twitter. I am Greg D. Dunlap on Twitter, Mars Toy Ship, and Rachel H. Underscore Design. Yeah. All right. Got it. Thanks a lot, everybody, and thanks for your patience. <laughs> <laughs>